Today I'm going to go to the book of First John. And I'm going to do a little bit of reading. First John 5 through 10 and chapter 2, 1 through uh, 3. Amen. You can say amen when you find it. Here's First John. First okay. John, what chapter? First John chapter number one. And I'll start reading verse number five. This then is the message which we have heard of him mm -hmm. and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, give us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And moving forward to verse, chapter number two, verse one. My little children, these things write out unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. And he is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Amen. May the Lord have listened to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. And what I want to use for a subject today is undeniable evidence. Amen. Undeniable evidence. Now, I like the way John, I like John, I like the way he keeps it real. Among all the New Testament writers, Heals is plain and practical. He gives us a plain and a practical explanation of our fellowship with God. Nothing is sugar-coated or masked over in difficult language. When you read his letters to the early church, you can't say that they are just too hard that you don't understand. Because John makes it plain. And he gets to the point. John desires that every believer can experience the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit through their relationship with Jesus Christ. He writes in a way that encouraged the reader to establish a bond with God through Christ so that the evidence of a true conversion will be seen in the outward manifestation of the righteousness of God. In other words, as a believer, we should be compelled to live right. Amen. But John had an issue. There was an issue he had to face. And if you ever witness to someone, we all have to face that same issue. In John's case, there were tons of false teachers going around talking about how we should live for Christ. And today, I'm sure you have witnessed to someone, first of all, you got to get through their own predetermined belief of what they think a Christian should be. Amen. Maybe it was put there by the doctor and said, amen, some dark preacher or somebody else who maybe mistaught him. 
it is hard to get rid of that misconception, get rid of that old knowledge before you can put something new in. Amen. I ran into people. I remember a guy that I bowled with. Yeah, I probably told the story, and he was trying to tell me about a book, Who Was the First King, Queen of Africa. And he told me, well, you can't be a pastor if you never read this book. I said, well, I don't need a guy drinking whiskey with a, with a beer ball in his hand telling me what a preacher's supposed to be about. I never had any more problems with him. <laughs> Amen. But John, he refused all of erroneous doctrines simply by encouraging believers to know the truth. Amen. And to walk in it. If you know the truth, the Bible says the truth will make you free. And he cautioned them and us about the foolishness of turning away from Christ. Amen. We all as Christians probably have had some confusion in our life. Amen. How many people in here would consider themselves middle class? Amen. But a Christian should never consider himself middle class. Not in the spiritual world because God don't create middle class citizens. We all want in Christ. The Bible said there is one baptism, one faith, one God and Father of all, who is in all and through all. If you are a Christian, you are his sheep. And he don't have first and second class sheep. We all on equal, equal ground. Amen. The politicians have told us that we are middle class. Amen. I, so I'm going to drop that from my vocabulary. <laughs> Amen. I may, may not have what somebody else has. I may not desire what they have, but I'm not in the middle. Mm -hmm. Amen. God produced, made all of us first. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to reduce in my mind who God created me to be. Amen. You, you, you're first on God's list. Amen. Even if you're on the bike or if you're in the rear, God said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He makes no distinction. Amen. You either in or you out. Amen. But as a person who accepts Christ, John says that you should know some it, there should be some indisputable evidence of your salvation. If you truly have accepted Christ, if you are the real deal, there ought to be some indisputable, undeniable evidence that you are following God. Amen. You can't, can't get away from it. Some wise person wants uh, a songwriter asked the question. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence found to convict you? Amen. If a Christian had to stand trial, being accused of being a Christian, if you're the real deal, the judge ought to be able to throw the book at you. Because of the undeniable evidence that's present. Amen. If faith in Jesus Christ, like in so many countries around the world, if it, if it was outlawed, amen, would the judge be able to throw the book at you? Or even worse, you may try to wiggle out of it, wiggle your way out of danger by denouncing your Savior. But the evidence are still there. Amen. Remember the case of Peter. Amen. When Jesus was on trial, Peter went in the crowd to see what was going to happen. Amen. And, and the Bible says Peter, according to Matthew 26 and 69, Peter sat without in the palace 
It means he was in the palace, but he set off to himself, hoping that he wouldn't be spotted. Amen. He wouldn't be recognized. Amen. But Peter found out he couldn't hide. He couldn't lie. And he couldn't curse his way out of danger. Uh, verse 69 saying, A young damsel, a young girl, came unto him and said, Thou also was with Jesus. Otherwise, you walk with Jesus. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what else thou sayest. In other words, Peter said, me no understand. <laughs> Amen, but it didn't work. So it got a little hot inside. Peter decided to go out on the porch and found the place out there. In verse 71, say, but another maid saw him and said unto them that were, were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denied with an oath. Probably crossed his heart and said, I do not know the man. Amen. But the evidence was undeniable. Because after a while, according to verse 73, it said, while after a while, came unto him they that stood by. In other words, it, there was a bunch of bystanders who didn't know Jesus, who probably was not saved, but they was observing Peter try to fumble and bumble his way out of knowing Christ. Amen. The bystanders say, surely thou art one of them. You're not one of us. They said, because thy speech betrays thee. Amen. You're not a sinner. You can't fake it. Because your speech is giving you away. Amen. In verse 74, then it said, began he to curse Peter, began to curse and to sweat. Amen. Say, I know not the man. But the problem with that, that was a sanctified rooster outside. <laughs> the Bible says the cock crew. The, amen. You, you ever heard a rooster crow? <laughs> Preacher, that roof and prophet say you lying. Huh? <laughs> Amen. Guilty as charged. So Peter was not successful in denying Christ because of the indisputable evidence. Had Peter been put on trial, he would have been convicted. Amen. But the rooster convicted him. And the Bible says he ran out and he wept bitterly. If you try to deny your Savior, once you have known him and walked with him, that rooster going to get you. Amen. Amen. The only thing you can do is fall to your knees. Amen. And weep. Amen. But there ought to be some indisputable evidence that you are a Christian, that you belong to Christ, and it should be visible for all to see. Not some cross around your neck that you can tuck under your shirt when you get in trouble. Or not some Bible that you carry on the seat of your car that, that you might stop by the church. John said that should be undeniable signs of your salvation. And what are those signs? If you are the real deal, 
if you are walking in the light, there are some signs you can't hide. Somebody will recognize you, even in a crowd, and don't start talking. It's all over. Amen. I heard a wise person say, once you can't catch a fish, so you open his mouth. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Peter started talking. And when he did that, they caught him. Amen. He couldn't even lie his way out of trouble. He probably said, me no understand, praise God. I don't know the man, hallelujah. Sinners don't talk that way. If you go into a crowd, I don't care if you can go to a family dinner, if you are the real deal, somebody has some signs they're going to recognize that you are not a sinner. Because when you walk into the room, Christ just arrived. Even if they don't see it, they're going to feel it. And don't try to deny it. Amen, because our rooster will <laughs> convict you. Amen. Amen. Amen, praise God. Now, first John say that we should walk in the light. When he say we should walk in the light, he's not talking about walking in the daylight or in the sunlight or walking in the moonlight and, and walking in the starlight. He's talking about walking in knowledge. That light is knowing the truth. Nobody can pull the wool over your eyes because you know the truth. Nobody can confuse you when you know the truth. When you know what you're talking about and you know that you know that you know. That's walking in the light. And that's what John wanted the people to understand. Don't get carried away with all the confusion. Just find out what the truth is. And the truth of that light is Jesus Christ. Amen. Walk in the light. And if we walk in the light, the scriptures say, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Amen. Have you ever white fireflies. If you see one, before long you're going to see a hundred. Amen. They move together. And that's the way Christians are. They're going to come together. Amen. And when he said we have fellowship, that's exactly what we are doing today. We are fellowshipping one with another. Amen. Because we all have like faith. Amen. We prefer to be with one another. Nobody have to beg us. Amen. To get us to surround ourselves with people of like faith. Because we, we want it that way. We prefer it to be that way. We are family. And family come together. Amen. Like John, I'm trying to make it plain. No one should have to twist our arms to get us to fellowship with the saints of God. It should be our pleasure because we have the same light within us. We know what the truth is. We should never desire to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's the scripture. Now sometimes sketches can get in the way, but it's never our preference because our preference is to fellowship with the saints. Amen. There are clear signs when a church is walking in the light, is striving on fellowship. The church will be full of effective testimony. There will always be opportunity to serve. And there are concerns for the needs of others. Prayer is a necessity and not a habit. And the Sunday morning parking lot will let you know 
who that empty spot belonged to. Amen. Because people, you know, we have a tendency to park in the same spot. We've been here since 04. I don't think I parked in a different spot. I think one time I came in, there was a car maybe in my spot. But I can look at the spot and I know who's missing. Amen. Also, John says that we need to confess our sins. He said that if we confess our sins and if he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Who wouldn't want to be cleansed from all unrighteousness? And all you have to do is confess your sins. Amen. And we are clean through the blood of Christ. Now, this may come as a shock to a few people, but confession don't end the day you get saved. John says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Don't let anyone convince you that they are a perfect Christian. Amen. If somebody says they don't do sin, the truth ain't in there. Amen. A lot of people may ask, oh, do you mean that I have to keep confessing day in and day out, even though Christ has forgiven me? And that answer is yes. Confession is a sign of repentance. And the reality is that Christians keep on sinning after salvation. Amen. It don't end that salvation because temptation, vanity, pride, and a host of Satan's tactics do their best to draw us away from God. But like a fish who thinks it can live on the beach, amen, it may flip and flop around for a while, but eventually it's going to realize that it can't survive there. Amen. You may flip in and out of sin, but you can't survive there. Amen. Your new nature strives in righteousness and obedience to God. Once you are born again, you are recreated for a different experience. But sin is our human nature in the flesh. And it's been that way ever since the fall of Adam. Well, thank God, Christ rescued us by paying the price for our sin nature. The scriptures say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It didn't say if you stop sinning, thou shalt be saved. But Paul explained he dealt with that in the sixth chapter of Romans. He said, Shall we continue in sin that God's grace may abound? He said, God forbid it. Christ has the power to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to teach us a better way of life. God know you're going to sin, but you don't sin. Continue to sin because you know God will forgive you. But even your best effort, sometime you're going to come up short. And that's what John is explaining. When you say you have no sin, I don't care how dedicated you are, somebody's going to get on your nerves sometimes. Amen. Somebody going to almost cause you to have a nuclear meltdown. Amen. Amen. You're going to have to Amen. Confess your sins. There's no way around it. Jesus didn't go to the cross because we are perfect. He said, I come to save those that are well need not a physician. But those who are sick, I thank you, Dr. Jesus. 
Amen. But we need to understand that. And that's why John makes it so plain. He lays it right out there. For even the average person can understand it. Amen. Confess your weakness. In Christ will make you strong. Confess your faults. In Christ will put you on a new path. Confess your failures. In Christ will put you on a path to victory. Now finally John says that we need to keep God's commandment. He says, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You have to know that you know that you belong to Christ by the way you live. There's a big difference in knowing God and knowing about God. Satan knows about God, but you know God if you follow him. You're not going to follow somebody you don't know. And I don't mean you follow him to church. Those who follow him to church, a lot of time, a lot of people drop him off at the door and say, thank you, God, for bringing me here. Amen. And they go into the church and get into their own flesh. I'm going to here and do my thing. Amen. They are none of Christ's. They don't belong to him. You are saved 24-7. I've seen many evangelists, amen, pray and get up and talk about how God delivered them in the church. And before long, they're up there proper lying. <laughs> amen. How you believe the power is in them and not in God. Amen. They, they're trying to steal his glory. They want you to focus on them. But your focus should be on Christ. Never take your eyes off the prize. I see many, I'm, I'm going to say it like a real so-called evangelist. Amen. One called me, myself and my wife up one time. We supposed to be in about, according to her, we, we've been all over the world by now, we we? Two or three times. Amen. We're going to be traveling, saving couple. Amen. We haven't been to Canada to save anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, get mad if you don't believe them. That's not the way it is. You bring God in. If you want a Christ, you can't leave him at the door. Because the, the Bible says, know you not that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And wherever you go, the Holy Spirit is present. Thank God for Jesus. Now, Romans 8 and 28 said, we are called according to his purpose. He calls all of us for a purpose. And if you don't perform that purpose, it won't be done. And we must follow his teaching in and out of the church. You get you just as saved on Tuesday or Monday as you are on Sunday. A very preacher told me once, tell the congregation one time, leave your hang-ups at the door. Man, I thought I'd come to church because I had a hang-up. What good is coming to church if I got a hang-up, I need prayer, and I'm going to leave it at the door. What I'm going to do, pick it up and take it back home with me? In other words, come in here and shout hallelujah, and we have in church. You end up performing. Amen. That's not having church. You are the church. <laughs> you can't have it. You say, everybody in here today, you are part of the church. You're part of Christ's body. And Christ's body is not lazy. Amen. We are to
perform some of the things that Christ did when he walked the earth. Now God expressed his commitment to us with a covenant. Now some may call it a contract, but the difference between a covenant and a contract, in a contract you can have some input. But a covenant, God works out all the details. Amen. He bears his signature in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and is signed in his blood. We express our commitment to the covenant through our obedience to God's moral code. And that moral code began with Adam and it was carried forward with Moses in the form of the Ten Commandments and the books of the law. Amen. It was concluded in the sacrifice of Christ by whose stripes we are healed according to 1 Peter 2 and 24. John makes the path to obedience plain. He says, keep his commandments. And there's no mystery there. Obedience means the rules are spelled out in the Holy Bible, written by men divinely inspired by God the author. And those are the principles by which God would judge us one day. Some people are still confused about what God desires of them. Maybe they haven't read enough Bible to be considered a Bible scholar. Maybe they are Christians in the making. But while you're on the path to spiritual growth, just listen to his voice. And his voice is not a loud voice. It's an eternal spiritual voice that whispers to your soul. Elijah heard it as a still small voice according to 1 Kings 19 and 12. The apostle James said that if you want to hear God's voice, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. James 4 and 8. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and follow them, and they follow me. John 20, 10 and 27. Amen. God doesn't use a loud voice. He don't holler across the ocean in the voice of a hurricane to get our attention. He don't holler upon the mountaintop that makes the mountain shake, crack, and smoke. But he speaks in a small, quiet voice. And if you want to hear God's voice, the scriptures say get close to him. Draw nigh to him. And he will draw nigh to you. And when you're close to God, he doesn't have to raise his voice to get your attention. Amen. I like to be close to God. I don't know about you. Amen. I found out when I was dating my wife, I wasn't good at this long distance communication. I wasn't good about writing letters and talking on the telephone. Amen. I want to come close. Amen. When I come close, I can whisper sweet nothing. Amen. I, I, when I come close, I can feel the embrace. Amen. Don't you want to feel like God sometimes put his arms around me? Yes. Try getting close to him. Amen. That's the way I was. I wanted to be close to somebody. Amen. I remember the last few years of work and I did have to do a lot of travel. And it was okay for maybe the first week. When I remember being in Europe and I'm calling in the midnight hour from across the ocean. But after about a week, I wanted to be close. Amen. Jack wasn't happy. <laughs> Jack was a dull boy. Amen. I want, I, want, I want to feel that thing. 
I want to feel God's touch. I want to feel his presence. And if you want that, you got to draw nigh to him. Amen. How do you draw nigh to him? Get in your prayer closet. Develop a relationship with him. And he will draw nigh to you. So yeah, I remember that when my wife dated her the close, I get the closest she gets. Oh. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. I didn't write it. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Amen. That's a good thing. Now believers have their responsibilities. There are battles we have to fight. There are temptations we have to resist. Habits we have to break. Amen. Trials we have to endure. Pain that we have to suffer. Enemies that we have to conquer. Amen. That's our responsibility. God commands us to follow him. And if we make sure we don't give up, God will make sure that we never give up. Just keep your feet on the rock and your hand on the plow and your eyes on the Lord. Now the world is full of darkness. Uh, it is dark out there. But if you keep your eyes on that light called Jesus, the darkness will disappear. Lust will give way to love. Vice will be replaced with virtue. Amen. Disgrace will be traded for honor. Amen. Immorality will be changed for morality. And guilt will be superseded by innocence. And when the judgment day come, there will be indisputable, overwhelming, undeniable, watertight evidence that you kept God's commands. There will be evidence that you were motivated by his love, anointed by his spirit, sanctified by his blood, and kept by his grace. Amen. And that is the message for today. Indisputable evidence. Amen. I can look out here today. I see indisputable evidence. Amen. You're too faithful. You wouldn't be here. I see good people. I, I don't see worldly people. I don't see the world. I see... God's creation. I see his image. We were all created in God's image. We may look different in the flesh, but that image is in the spirit. And it's wrapped in love. And I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for John making the claim. Amen. A lot of things I learned by reading the Bible. And some things can sometimes, if you listen to man, can trip you up. It can make sense. I remember I used to work around the fellow, and he used to say, Well, I can't see how a holy God is going to give somebody who maybe killed 50 people and raped children and did this. I can't see him giving them the same punishment as somebody who just robbed the bank or stole some money. Well, I thought about it for a while. That appeared to make sense. But then the Holy Spirit told me, don't think about it. It's not God ain't punishing you. He give you a chance to come on board. Amen. Because we are to live eternal with God. 
Amen. You can't come in God's presence with sin. Amen. So you're really doing it to yourself. Amen. If you say everybody had to take a bath before they come in, you don't want to take it. You don't want to wash away your sins. You can't come in. If you let sin in, then eternal heaven wouldn't be holy. So he's thinking about God punishing. God don't punish you. He gives you all kinds of chances. Amen. You punish yourself. It's like when Noah built the ark. Noah do who didn't get on board before it was too late. Amen. Drowned. God didn't do what they did themselves. And look at the people who sometimes get caught up in a hurricane. There are all kinds of warnings telling the people to get out. Head for high ground, but guess what? Somebody think they're going to ride it out. Somebody try to stick it out and you see what happens. Amen. But if you listen to God's voice, you do the right thing and get out. Amen. I hear people, God going to get you. <laughs> That's confused. I've been told that I heard preachers say that God going to get you. God going to strike you down. He's going to strike you down. You struck yourself now. Amen. I hope that makes sense to somebody. It's how, sometimes it's how you think about a thing. And how it let the spirit of God open up the scripture to you. I used to try to read the Bible. I'm going to read two chapters a day. And sometimes I couldn't get past a certain voice. Because that voice meant so much. It touched my heart. I couldn't, couldn't go past it. Couldn't get away from it. Because I, I knew that it related to me. Thank God for Jesus. 